House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren. Joining me today as co-host, we've got Mr. Michael Hawley. Hello, how are you doing, Al? I'm doing good. Well, as good as can be, you know. <laughs> Lots going on. Um, oh. yeah, you're doing well, of course. You, you just got you got back from L.A. You were making that big TV appearance on. Yeah, uh, yeah. History's greatest mysteries will be. Uh, I think around April time frame that they'll, they'll pop on and then uh, get to see my uh, radio face. <laughs> yeah, and you, of course, you're the biggest mystery that they've got in history. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. It works. Yeah, it works. It never ends. I'll tell you. Okay, well, now today uh, we have an interesting guest. We have a science fiction writer from the U.K. First, when I saw his picture, I thought we were talking about Sean Bean. You know, I thought it's exciting here. But no, it's not. It's uh, Mr. Gareth Powell. Now, thank you for being here, Gareth. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, Did people get you mixed up with Sean Bean? No, that's never happened before. Um, (laughs) First time. I've I've been told I... Look like Brendan Gleeson a few times, but not sure mean. Well, now you go. Now you have. I think you look like him. But I mean, at least your picture does on the uh, on your um, you know Amazon page. Yeah. Well, does that mean uh, that I'm going to have to die halfway through this? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, he never makes it to the end of a series. <laughs> no, uh, I, I don't think so. But you never know, Mike. I I don't trust him. So. <laughs> Um, well, Gareth, you, you've written a lot of books. Uh, I see quite a few books here under this. Um, have you been writing all your life? Is this something that you've done since you were a young kid? Or Yeah, I mean, I started writing books in inverted commas when I was at primary school, um, sort of age, I remember, six or seven, writing um, in spiral-topped reporter's notebooks. Um, great long rambling stories that were basically cribbed off that night's episode of Star Trek or, or Battlestar Galactica and kind of with the names changed and, and uh, some of my own ideas thrown in. So, yeah, I mean, I've always done it. Um, you know, I used to fold, get four or five pages of A4, fold them in half and staple the spine to create a little book and then draw all the pictures and write a story in it so it's something i've done since i was very small um i think my grandmother at one point i wrote a story called death trap um and my grandmother said oh you could be a professional writer and i think i was about eight years old so you know she doomed me um, <laughs> well but that's good that's good to have that, that that kind of support in a way um you know um yeah is, uh, so how did you get into writing? How did you decide to get something published? When I was um, 16 or 17, um, I won a school competition um, where you had to write a short story in the first three chapters of a novel. And the prize was to have your work reviewed by Diana Wynne Jones. Um, so I met her in a coffee shop one morning and uh, she went through and, and really tore my writing to shreds um but it was the first professional uh feedback i'd ever had and it kind of opened my eyes and it was like oh i don't just have to write like i'm writing for an english literature a level i can write like i want to tell a story um i don't have to use all the long fancy words i can just tell a story um and that kind of sowed the seed. And then when I went to university, I did creative writing. One of my tutors was the novelist Helen Dunmore, um, who taught, taught me more in one afternoon than I'd learned in three years of uh, English literature at school. And I went on from there and, you know, never thought I could make a career out of being a writer. I had no idea how you went about doing that. So I got the usual sort of postgraduate jobs in call centres and um, ended up working in marketing. But then one day I read um, Burning Chrome by William Gibson. Mm. And I thought, you know, oh, 
that's how you do it. And that just gave me the confidence to to stop trying to write like Arthur C. Clarke or, or Robert Heinlein and just write kind of what I knew from kind of like a grunt's perspective um, and just start writing those stories. So I wrote, I wrote some short stories that were kind of Gibson-influenced and then I gradually started to find my own voice. I mulched in some other influences and all the stuff I'd read. And eventually that kind of bore fruit when I was about, um, ooh, how old was I? I was, I was about 35 when I had my first Interzone publication. So, yeah, it took a while. Yeah. So that critique really helped you out then? It, it definitely was one of the kind of, you know, I think in life there are, you can probably identify about half a dozen turning points that set you on the course you're on now. And that was definitely one of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Things like that. You know, we come across that. So, did you push her down the stairs on the way out for coffee? Or <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, she. I. I don't know if you. You ever met her or you know her, but she had this huge bush of sort of black and grey hair and looked. Um, you know, was dressed very exotically, and I think, if I recall correctly, she had a leather jacket and like a big scarf. She looked very witchy, and I was frankly terrified. <laughs> fear, fear works. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, that's, it's it's interesting. So it's, there's a certain freedom that comes with that when you just start to let go and and just write from your own your own mind, just your own self. Hey, yeah, I think, um, and having talked to other writers over the years, I think we all start out trying to emulate our influences, but it's when. Um, there comes a sudden point where you're writing something and you, you suddenly realise you're writing just from yourself, just it's coming from yourself. You're not trying to to write like anybody else anymore and you think that sentence is all mine and you suddenly realise you found your voice and then you have to kind of develop that and, and sort of chase that and work, work out what that is. Um, and that's that's the moment everything sort of clicks into place. I guess, I guess it's like, um, if you're learning the trumpet or something, you play like Miles Davis or you play like Dizzy Gillespie, and then suddenly you play a riff and it's just come completely from you and you think, oh, that's how I play it. And then you kind of have your own style. I think it's the same with writing. Certainly. Uh, you know, uh, now science fiction is your, is, is, is what you write. Um, I wonder if, um, if something like that, where do you get the uh, ideas for your stories? Do they come in dreams? Do they come in, um, where, where does it start for you? Uh, they come from all over the place. Uh, um, I have had stories that have come from dreams where I've woken up and thought that is just too crazy, I have to write that down. Um, and But sometimes I've just thought of a character and sort of built a story from that character, or I've thought of like some wacky situation and kind of built a world around that in order for that to happen. So, um, you know, I, th I thought I wrote one story which was um, based around the idea of what if there was a machine that could turn you into anything you wanted. Um, and then that, a whole story grew out of that one um, called The Last Reef, which was my first Interzone story. Um, so they come, from, they come from sort of a diverse number of places and sometimes an idea isn't enough you need to find another idea and then kind of squash them together in order to get a, a good story um, the example I'd give would be John Wyndham's Day of the Triffids right. where he had an idea for you know an edible plant but on their own they're not much threat because you know you can just run away from them or get your lawnmower out and poof. but um, then he at the, the meteor shower that makes everybody blind and suddenly those plants are really scary because they can be right there and you don't know they're there. So it, it's funny those two kind of that intersection of ideas is usually where the, the sweet spot comes and the good stories are. Yeah, that's, it, it's an interesting um, idea. Do you, when you, so when you're writing and like you're getting to, you know, writing a space science fiction or um, some, some story, do you, do you take from, other, I don't know, established rules, let's say, about, let's say, space and aliens and Mars and all that, do you kind of take from popular 
culture and kind of what people think about different things, you know, it, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like if you wrote about a vampire or a werewolf, werewolf, do you take ideas, do you give them the, the, the same rules that others do? I think there are conventions and tropes in any branch of literature, and all literature is a kind of a conversation with itself. So you can't write about, for instance, an alien invasion of the world without bearing in mind, like, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds or the movie Independence Day. And, you know, there are so many different versions of that in popular culture that you have to be aware of them and you have to, whether to reference them or to avoid referencing them, but you, you have to be aware that they're there. Um, and you mentioned vampires as well. I mean, every vampire story that is written now has to, in some way, reflect everything that's gone before because it's a subject that's been done so thoroughly in so many different ways that you have to, you know, acknowledge or subvert or do something to put a new spin on it. Um, but yeah, I try to stay away from those kind of archetypal stories as much as possible. Um, because as I said, they're very well trodden ground and probably trodden by it in ways that will stand the test of time more than anything I could add to, the, to that conversation. So I, I try to kind of steer into slightly different backwaters and find find the, the new stuff in there. That's good that it's all new. That's nice. I wouldn't claim it's all new, but um, <laughs> obviously I, I have my, my influences and, and, you know, stuff I've... I've I'm covering has, has been done before, I'm just hopefully finding the less common stuff and doing it in a slightly different way. Do you have the, uh, you, all those short stories you have, have you enlarged those, uh, or do you kind of keep it separate? A couple of the short stories I wrote that were in my first collection, uh, I did expand them into a novel at one point. Um, and then there was another story I wrote about a, a computer-generated monkey, which um, accidentally got expanded into a three-novel series. So, it's um, yeah, I think short stories are an extremely good place to work out ideas and to test ideas to see, you know, if they've got the legs for a longer story, and sometimes they will and sometimes they won't. But um, short stories for me are all about ideas, whereas novels tend to be all about character. So it's... Um, Short stories are a very good kind of test firing range for uh, your ideas. So um, now on your newest book that's coming out here in March, um, Stars and Bones, and it's a continuance novel, um, what's the premise of this book? The premise of this book is that in roughly 75 years' time, um, an sort of uh, almost omnipotent, alien being stumbles across the earth and decides to save the earth um, it does not however decide to save humans because it decides to save the earth from the humans so it gathers the human race up and puts us aboard a fleet of arcs and tells us to go away um, go off into space and don't go messing up any other planets because we can't be trusted to be in charge of a biosphere without polluting it and messing it up and all that. So the human race is adjusting to a kind of nomadic lifestyle and adjusting to its place in a cosmos filled with these sort of almost unimaginably powerful beings. And then a scout ship that's flying ahead of the fleet runs into something fairly terrible and goes missing. And the sister of one of the crew um, decides to lead a search party to find what happened to them, and uh, it all goes from there. It's, I would say it's kind of like a cross between Battlestar Galactica and The Thing in some ways. <laughs> oh, it, 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 it's, it's kind of an interesting thought. So it, do you ever have, like, um, subtext, or do you kind of have something in your mind when you're writing these stories that you kind of hope the reader takes away from the book after they read it? 
Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you always have kind of your opinions and your views and all of that is sort of bubbling away underneath and feeding into the story. Um, I always try to avoid editorialising, so I'll never kind of come straight out and make my opinion. You know, the, char- the characters in the book will have opinions, um, some of which I'll agree with and some of which I won't. Um, but, you know, I, I do, I think that people who read the books will come away with a fairly accurate idea of my kind of general views. Your characters, like, so how do you create characters and, and make them so that they're very believable or um, complex enough that people um, understand them? Like, are they people that you, you you know or you've met or you see someone on the street or in a coffee shop or in a pub and then you kind of go, mm, I like this, this behavior or something, and you use that, or is it just totally out of the blue? Usually, as, as I say, I'll, I'll have a situation in mind, and then I'll think, who do I need? What characters do I need to explore this situation? Um, so I'll come up with, with some characters. And usually when I'm coming up with a character, I kind of think that all of us have a place in our lives where we're damaged. Something happened to us in the past that damaged us. Um, whether it's like loss of a parent or, or some, you know, injury or some illness or loss of a pet. Everybody has something that caused them some damage and the way we heal from that damage informs the way we respond to future situations. So I will try and for each character to think of what, have, what traumatic thing in their past, um, change them as people and then that informs that if they're thrown into a similar situation they will maybe react in a different way than somebody who's not gone through that kind of trauma so every character has that you sort of unique way of reacting to the world that's based on kind of uh, healing from the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune quite a few people that we talk to authors of writing and fiction um talk about their relationship with these characters, that the characters they've written. And some of them will go as far as to describe them as like family and friends or children and things like that. And they have this, um, almost like they're real. And some of them say that they're real. Um, what's your relationship with your characters? Do you have that same sort of feeling or are you completely different? I think most of my characters have at least part of me in them um, because I write from you know I try to get authentic by kind of writing authentically from my own experience um, or from you know experiences of I've had related to me or, or so forth so I don't I've never felt that they're actually real um, you know I, I actually do have children and a family and I know I know the difference there because, you know, um, children can be much more annoying. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> whereas characters do what they're told. But, um, no, it's, it's, no, I, I, I do get very, I do get very fond of some characters. I do enjoy writing them, it, which is difficult because sometimes you have to put them through the ringer in order to make a good story. So you can't get too fond of them. Um, but usually once the, once the story's finished and I walk away from them, I don't look back particularly. It's interesting. It's, it's just so interesting to hear different writers um, talk about their characters and, 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 and stories and stuff like that. Um, do, you, do you think that um, these kinds of stories, science fiction, like you've got this with the, the Earth 75 years from now and yeah, human race and the dying earth and stuff like that, and they're kind of a cause. Do you do you think that kind of represents um, the worlds we kind of live in at the time you write the books? I think, yes, all science fiction really is a kind of reflection on the time in which it's written um, because you're taking the world of today and, and saying, what would happen if I made... X, Y, and Z different, or what would happen if this thing that we're doing today continues to a ridiculous degree? What would the world look like then? So, you know, at the same way that 
when George Orwell wrote 1984, he was really writing about 1948. What happens with science fiction is it's mainly holding a mirror up to reality. Um, but it's a, like a crazy funhouse mirror, so we get to distort various bits of the world in, in interesting ways and say, look, this is... I want to talk, for instance, about... Uh, let me just think of a topic offhand. I, w I want to talk about economics. So in order to do that, I will invent a s society um, like Ian Banks did, which is a patient scarcity society where anybody there can have any material object they want and the amount of food they want. Nobody is poor. There is no money. Wallop. And so he writes about that as a utopia, um, a utopia with a, a slightly dark underside. Um and by doing that, he's not just living, he's, he's commenting on the system we have today by showing it's a completely different system. So I think he wrote that in the sort of dark days of Thatcherism in the 70s and 80s. So he's very much, although he seems to be talking about something completely removed in time and space, very much commenting on the world in which it was written. Has the COVID um, experience uh, influenced any of your writing uh, not directly, no, although coincidentally, Stars and Bones, uh, the majority of which was written before uh, COVID really oh, okay. kicked in, does uh, unfortunately feature some times when the entire fleet has to go into severe quarantine measures, which was, uh, more, which was more influenced by the movie Alien than by COVID, but um, it, it gets to the point where you're sitting there under lockdown writing about quarantine and you start thinking, oh, God, this is a little too on the nose. So, <laughs> so, you, so you started it. Is that what I'm hearing, Gareth? <laughs> yes, it was all my fault. Yeah. <laughs> it's all your fault. Um, and now we at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. So, with um, someone that's never read your books before, um, uh, which one book would you tell them to read in order to get kind of the flavor of what kind of writer you are? The book I've written that, seen, that has certainly sold the most, but certainly seems to have provoked the biggest kind of outpouring of enthusiasm from readers is a book called Embers of War. It uh, came out in 2018. It's the uh, space opera about a sentient battleship who decides to resign from the Navy and, and help people instead of blowing things up and uh, struggles with that decision and with her inbuilt instincts to lay waste to planets instead of um, doing good. But, um, she develops a conscience, in other words. So um, that's the one. It's the first of uh, three book series, um, and it's currently being adapted for television. So get in and read it now, and, and then you'll be ahead of the curb uh, when it comes out. That's when, great. Would you, would, so when you're doing a series like that of, of Embers of War, do you sort of outline your, your work and you kind of know how it begins and where it's going to end and the books just kind of get you there? Or is this totally just ad hoc? It's just as you go. Um, Embers was uh, sold to Titan Books as a trilogy. So we, my agent sold it as a trilogy. So at that point I had written the first book and then I had sort of back of an envelope sketches of what would happen in the second two books. So, um, 
and it was kind of bought on that basis. They, they kind of read the first book and really liked it, and then commissioned the two the two sequels at the same time. So uh, I didn't have all the fine details hammered out because when you follow characters and the characters drive the narrative, they can go off in slightly unexpected directions and change things. But I had a pretty good kind of sketch map of where it was going to end up. Well, it's interesting. So you, you, you have characters that have actually gone off the rails, gone places where you didn't expect? Very much so. Um, because there's, there's nothing that kind of throws you out of a story harder than a character doing something stupid or some, doing something out of character just to fit the needs of the plot. So, you know, I try to, if I get to a point where I just think, no, that character just simply wouldn't do that, then I have to kind of work around and find a different path. Um, so, you know, I try to follow the characters because I think it readers will follow a, a, a character they sympathise with and identify with um, and get quite annoyed if those characters suddenly turn around and just do something that's just quite ridiculous just to further um, obviously the, the needs of the plot. I mean, how many times have uh, we screamed at cinema screens when the character decides to, you know, let's all go into the haunted house or, you know, I'm going down to the scary basement by myself and things like that. And you think, well, in that situation, that character just simply wouldn't do that. They'd turn or run the other way. So you have to try and be a bit more kind of authentic in your approach. Yeah, it's 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 a kind of a, yeah, it's an interesting area. Now, space opera, you've mentioned that. So how do you describe, like, what is a space opera for, uh, I've heard that term a lot lately, so I'm, I'm curious about um, what it's, what it encompasses. Well, it started out actually as a, a derogatory term um, back in the 40s and 50s, I think, where it was likened to a soap opera and uh, westerns were known as horse operas. And so um, they started calling them the space operas, which was kind of very pulpy, very trashy. Um, kind of space adventure serial where you could have just set it in the Wild West and nobody would have noticed the difference. Um, and then that kind of term kind of got reclaimed over the years and then especially in the sort of the turn of the millennium, the new space opera that came out of a lot of UK write, were, were writing. It became a term for kind of large widescreen kind of space adventure dealing with big themes, um, sort of life, death, the history of the universe, everything in between, um, and sort of very dramatic. And so it's kind of come a kind of a catch-all for that kind of big space-based adventure. Um, but modern space opera is, is sort of so far away from that early kind of Buck Rogers stuff. It's now dealing with, as I said, the, the big questions of, you know, who are we? What do we do while we're here and where are we going? And what's going to happen after we die and what happened before we got here? Um, and it's, it's dealing with that and our relationship past an uncaring cosmos. You know, I wonder, the um, there's so many categories now, so many uh, genres of of science fiction, you know, with hard science fiction and and all the all these different names. Do you do you sort of try to be one category of sci-fi, or do you like one better than the other? No, I don't. I mean, they are at the end of the day, they're marketing categories um, designed to help um, readers identify books like the ones they've just read. Um, so if you say, I've read this. I want to find more books like that. What What is this? You say, Oh, that's space opera, or that's hard sci-fi. It's the same in crime writing where you have like cosy mysteries and hard-boiled detective and stuff. But, you know, a lot of people read and enjoy all sorts of different stories from all sorts of different subgenres. And a lot of people outside the field don't even know the names of all these subgenres. They're just sci-fi books. Um, so I tend to take the kind of increasing kind of more and smaller and smaller balkanization of, of the genre into all these different tiny sub 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 genres with a, a huge pinch of salt because I, I read all of them um, and I enjoy all of them and they're just different ways of telling stories. 
Is yeah. that part of your research for a book? Is to read other or, or the different ideas, or um, do you research? This is coming from no, us I'm, nonfiction guys that we research like crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, the the reason I read other sci-fi um, is because uh, I I write sci-fi because I love reading it, um, and I grew up reading it, and I grew up on on science fiction, so that's kind of why I, I still read it now. I also, you know, now I'm published, I read it in some ways to keep in touch. My publisher tends to send me um, advanced copies of books that are coming out because they want me to put a quote on the cover, so I, I get to keep up with a lot of what's happening in the genre. Um, okay. And a lot of the book, books are, are books by friends of mine who are other writers, so I try and keep up with their, them as well. So it's not so much research, but it's just keeping abreast of what everyone else is doing. Do you ever read a sci-fi book you didn't like from a friend? You want to tell us or na his name now, or um, not? <laughs> no, I've definitely read books I, I've hated, it, but not one by anyone I knew. So, um, so who do you, who do you like in science fiction? Um, I guess some of the older writers, some of the ones before, not modern day, or do you like modern day? Like, what's where do you stand on sci-fi? What's your favorite? Um, I grew up reading sort of Langevin and Arthur C. Clarke, as I said, and Robert Heinlein. Um, I kind of got most of, most of what I read at the moment is, is very modern, so, um, particularly I'm reading, uh, a lot of Aliette de Baudard at the moment. Um, she's writing about a, a, a society set in space in hundreds of years' time, but from, that grew from Vietnam, so it's it's kind of a completely different cultural base than what we usually think of when we think about um, sort of space empires. So it's um, it's very interesting. Adrian Tchaikovsky is a uh, a, a fellow British writer um, who's writing a phenomenal number of books. He seems to have a new one out every fortnight. I mean, it's, uh, it makes the rest of us look really bad, uh, but the quality of what he's writing is amazing. I can just can't get enough of. What, what he's putting out in the world at the moment. There, there are, you know, an awful lot of good writers um, working in the genre. Um, and a lot of new voices that have come through in the last decade from minorities um, and from groups that weren't traditionally associated with the genre as well. Um, I, I would say probably at least six or seven out of the ten of my favourite novels of the last four or five years have been written by women and uh, people of colour, so it's a very different kind of injection of different influences and ideas and voices that's really kind of given the, the, the genre a kind of vividness um, that it has at the moment. That's very, very exciting. What do you think the most important aspect of a good science fiction is? What is it that you look for in a good science fiction? I look for something that a engages me, but also something that makes me think, but not necessarily in a kind of dry, kind of scientific way, like maybe very old science fiction was just elucidating the scientific ideas. I think now the readership has matured somewhat, and we are more familiar with a wider range of scientific um, theories than, than perhaps when science fiction set out to be kind of like an educational genre. Now we are more au fait with that sort of thing, so I'm looking for things that explore topics that are larger and maybe more in-depth and more to do with the characters as well as the worlds in which they find themselves. So I'm looking for escapism, but I'm also looking for something that will kind of make me think about who I am as a person and my relationship with the universe. You know, when you, we we went back, if we go back to the uh, Ambers of War and you talk about being signed to do a television show based on it, does that make you feel like um, there's a lot of pressure behind that or how it turns out or what they do with it? Um, not especially, no. I mean, I've read, I've, I read the first draft of the pilot script, which was phenomenally good because obviously they had to make some changes because a lot of rope just isn't doable on screen. Um, but there's a director attached in the studio and they're, they're writing a, a second draft of the pilot now and then they're going to start shopping it to networks. Um, I have a small consultancy role within that process 
Um, but it's a completely different art form. Television is is not my wheelhouse. I, I write novels, so I'm happy to be the scriptwriter and the director and the people who know how television works will adapt that material for that art form. Um, obviously, I hope it does well, because then... You know, obviously, I'd like all my other books to be adapted as well, and you know, for huge briefcases full of Hollywood money to come, arrive on my doorstep. But um, we can, we can, but hope. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope it does well, but uh, it's out of my hands. So I'm trying not, to, you know, I, I don't get anxious about it. I mean, I will, you know, when the first episode hits the screen, I will be a very nervous dude, but. Until that point, it's this, you know, it's all out of my hands. Proud yeah. father. I have a question, Gareth. The uh, you have a family, and you're writing these novels, and you're reading profusely. Uh, how do you do it? Do you set your schedule up? Is there a certain time that you uh, set to write, or how do you do that? No, I mean, ideally, that would be a good way to do things. That's how things were in the early years. But now my kids are older, so their schedules are are different. Um, so I don't get evenings to myself anymore because they you know they tend to stay up later than I do. So and they you know they need lifts to work in the morning or lifts to school, and, and it's um, I kind of end up just doing that classic kind of working parent thing of, of trying to do everything and dropping the ball <laughs> all over the place and right, uh, right. Never, get, never feel like never feel I'm doing enough with everything because um, I was running from one to the other so yeah it's just a, it's a situation I think an awful lot of people over the last few years have found themselves in with now so many people have been working from home with families they've lost that kind of separation between work and home um, and it can be a very difficult juggling act oh that's that could be another sci-fi movie right there or a book <laughs> something in there. I think you're on to something. <laughs> when you get to reviews and stuff like that, do do you follow reviews or do you interact with people that review any of your work? Um, I don't obsessively look for reviews or anything. I mean, nowadays we have social media, so off times I will become aware of a review because someone will post it on Twitter and tag me in. Um, so I'll stick my nose in and, and have a look. And um, I'm, I'm fortunate I, I re- rarely get bad reviews. Um, and if I do, well, you know, not everybody can like everything. So, you know, art is subjective. So, uh, you know, you shrug and move on. Um, the idea, I guess, is is you don't let the good reviews go to your head and you don't let the bad reviews go to your heart. You have to kind of maintain some distance and usually by the time the reviews are coming out I'm one or two books further along because you know of the the time it takes for books to be published but by the time a book comes out and started getting reviewed obviously I'm really keen for it to do well but I'm halfway through the next one so it's it doesn't feel like the end of the world uh, because I'm already working on the next thing um but yeah, I mean that that's sad. I'm fortunate that most of the reviews I get are, are great. I never go on to sites like Goodreads or you know I try not to look at the reviews on Amazon um, simply because you know I think if you spend too much time worrying about these things, you can drive yourself kind of into a state of self consciousness about what you're writing that makes it very difficult to carry on writing. Um, I noticed this especially when Embers of War came out. Um, I wrote Embers of War, it got accepted, and it went off to the publishing process. While it was doing that, I wrote the sequel, Fleet of Knives, uh, which I I wrote very quickly, really enjoyed it, a great time. But then when I came to write the third book, the first book had just come out and was getting massively great reviews. And that froze me, in a way, because I was writing the third book, I thought, oh, my God, they love the first book. And suddenly there was a performance expectation there that this had to be, this third one had to be a great book to to live up to the first one. So in some ways, you know, good reviews can be as paralyzing as bad ones. So 
you know, in the end it spurred me on and I, I you know, I did my best and uh, I think I managed to stick the landing, but um, spending too much time obsessing about reviews can only kind of harm the writing that you're doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You don't want it to become your focus. You know, it, it takes you off your game then, you know. Um, now, social media. Um, do, you, do you like to interact with readers on social media or do you have a website? How do you like people to um, kind of um, get a hold of you? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I have a website, which is um, www.garethlpowell.com. Um, and I spend a lot of time on Twitter um, at Gareth L. Powell, where I do talk to a lot of readers. Um, I'm fairly open. I give a lot of writing advice. Um, I do a lot of Q&As, and I help boost other writers and recommend books and, and, and stuff like that. So I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, and I've got a great kind of community around me on there as well. So... Um, that's very good. I also use a site called Patreon, um, which is like a crowdfunding site where people can, you know, give a dollar or five dollars or whatever they feel comfortable with a month. And in return for that, I publish kind of deleted scenes and unpublished stories and, and other sort of stuff, exclusive kind of content there for them as well. And that, that really helps keep me going between book deals um so i'm I'm pretty active instagram as well um where i'm at gareth l powell is a, is a different creature as well i put up a lot of stuff about books and photographs and and uh books i'm reading and so on so yeah I'm, i would say i'm probably a little too active on social media because i should probably get off there and write more books but uh oh, well. I, I, I found I, I found that interaction to be really helpful with readers, and I think it has helped drive a lot of book sales because people see that I'm being very open and, and engaged with the readership, so they kind of check the books out, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, you have to get on TikTok next, you know, start dancing and... <laughs> Um, we'll have all that up on our website as well, so people can find you with one click and uh, get right to you. And um, so, what kind of advice do you would you give a writer or someone that's writing that hasn't been published yet in these modern times of Amazon and everything? What What do you suggest? Um, in In terms of writing, just to re read everything you can get your hands on, um, especially modern stuff that's coming out, just to kind of keep an idea of where things are going, where the genre is, and then you can kind of, you know, Wayne Gretzky, uh, the ice hockey player, said he he didn't try to, to go where the puck was, he tried to go where the puck would be by the time he got there. And uh, it's it's the same with writing. I mean, you look at the, the genre, you think the trends in, in, in publishing, is, and then you kind of think, well, where will this be in two years when my book is done? So you can't predict it, and in a lot of ways you just have to write what you want to write, but you have to at the same time think, well, if I've got this, you know, if I want to write this zombie epic, like five big zombie books have come out this year, it's probably not going to be the best time. So you have to kind of keep an eye on what's going on in the genre, and at the same time stay true to what you want to do, and that is a juggling act. Um, in terms of promoting books and, and, and so forth, it's... Uh, Patty Smith, uh, the, the punk singer, um, quoted something that William Burroughs said to her, which was, keep your name, name clean, build a good name, do good work, and eventually your name will be its own currency. So, you know, uh, it's just like, do your best work, only put your best work out there, keep going, be persistent, and eventually, you know, you will have built a brand that is you and people will start coming to you for that. Hmm. Yeah, that's good advice. I like that one. Yeah. So, Star Wars or Star Trek? Both. <laughs> Both. Um, <laughs> I, I could give 
if you uh, that's the short answer. I give you much, much, much longer answer. Trust me. <laughs> that's the short one. Well, that, that's all. It did. So now we know. Keep them guessing. You know. <laughs> well, uh, it's been a great conversation. We're glad you were able to join us today. Uh, the book we're promoting is coming out, I believe, March uh, 1st of this year. It's called Stars and Bones. It's a continuance novel. And the um, author has been our guest, Gareth L. Powell. Thank you for being here. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.